Okay guys, today we're looking at early oceanic exploration, specifically the, the different voyages and ships that took place before Columbus. Because in um, past popular narrative, um, a lot of times the type of um, oceanic explorations uh, would, would start with Columbus, as if the Europeans um, were the ones to first discover and um, develop this ability. And the reality is, is that there were um, plenty of peoples who uh, not only had advanced ships, but um, navigation skills and uh, actual travel um, uh, in the ocean through to various parts of the world. And so we're going to look at those early ones um, uh, up to right before Columbus um, and see kind of what they did, the type of ships that they used, you know, what, what were they doing? that type of thing. So the first uh, group that we're looking at um, is the Polynesians. And um, the Polynesians are definitely, like I said, the oldest. Um, and and perhaps the, not honestly the most controversial anymore, but for the longest time they were um, dismissed as having the ability to intentionally navigate, if you will. Um, there were um, um, several questions that, that, that emerged, in, in part um, because many European explorers later suggested that there was no possible way that they were capable of, of, of traveling to the different locations that they did. Um, and so let, I'm going to put those questions first, and then we're going to look at, um, you know, the, those kind of those answers to those questions um, and talk about, um, you know, where they went and, and the types of ships that they used for that. So um, let's see, let's put questions here. Ooh. Right. So the questions that had emerged, and again, these are not, um, you know, I'd, I'd say that this was proven in... The, they actually had an explorer who they replicated one of the early, early uh, Lapita uh, ships, the canoes, outrigger canoes, um, with all of the old like technology. They didn't use any new technology. They, they replicated a build and then sailed around to the different locations to prove that it was possible. Um, they didn't use modern navigation tools or any of that. And, and so in the late 70s, you have an actual um, a proof of that, and then it just continued to be proven over and over again. Um, but but you definitely um, still see remnants of that. Again, not so much in the last fifteen years, uh, ten to fifteen years. But you you it's still sometimes in certain textbooks that it's often ignored um, or not talked about, and you kind of just skip to Columbus. And and so it's important to address these, even though like I said, these are not questions that really people have any more. Um, but they were ones that were constantly brought up until they were proved that this was indeed possible. Um, so the first was, um, you know, was migration. Um, because, of course, one of the things that you have is that they um, uh, set out from Taiwan and ended up in a variety of, of uh, somewhat remote um, islands between 1100 to 900 BCE. Um, and, and then continued from there on. So the, one of the first questions was my migration to the various islands intentional or accidental. So one of the, the theories back in the day that um, went around was that, well, it had to be accidental. They just drifted to these islands. Um, the second question is, um, what were um, the navigational um, skills that they used, right? Because we know that they didn't have the compass yet, um, and and so the there was the how how did they figure out how to get to these islands? with with no of the modern and and even the modern not like what we have today but even like I said the compass was such a massive in, innovation that allowed for travel uh, a lot more travel and it definitely was super important because you had some people who had these early navigational skills that we're going to talk about here with the polynesians but but the majority of of where you see this kind of mass push of of um, oceanic exploration comes because of the creation of the compass and specifically the magnetic compass which then allows for um, um, more accurate navigation 
as well as map making. So it, it plays a really important role in the development of um, ocean exploring, but there was many who thought that it really wasn't possible to do what the Polynesians did uh, without it or something similar. And then the last question, um, what, um, why has this navigational knowledge, um, been lost? And, and, I mean, you could, I, I suppose you could argue, um, you know, why isn't it more well known, right? So that, because one of the things that the arguments that came from this was that, well, you know, no one's heard of their navigational skills. So how do we know what they did? Um, and why isn't there record of it? Why wouldn't there be record of that stuff? So we're going to look, we're going to look at those kind of three areas. As I mentioned, if you're looking at like kind of the ancestors of the Polynesians, um, were the Lapita and they, um, set out from Taiwan to various islands, um, in the Pacific and from 1100 to around 900 BCE, right? And that's who we're looking at for, for, for those questions. Um, I suppose we could put one more question too, is, is what type of ships did they use, right? Because we are going to look at that as well. Um, so they were um, skilled seafarers um, and, and in a variety of ways that we end up learning as far as what they're able to do. And they specifically developed um, that what were outriggers and double canoes. And I think that's some of what's also impressive with it is just the um, this is, you know, this is one of the oldest groups, and yet it's the kind of smallest ship. Um, the Vikings come pretty close, too, but they stick more to rivers and coastal areas. They don't kind of go out, they go out a little bit to the open ocean, but not to the same extent that the Polynesians did. And so you have these kind of smaller ships that many said were not open ocean uh, um, seaworthy, right? And we'll look at some pictures in just a second. Um, and, uh, these, the double canoes, which made the larger voyage across the Pacific possible. Um, they had smaller canoes, of course, for, for local island hopping and things like that. <clears throat> but it was these double canoes that allowed them to really go, uh, into the open ocean. Um, and we know that, um, we see evidence of, of the culture through their pottery. There is um, pottery and designs that were left um, in a variety of um, islands as early as 2000 BC, right? And those were the ones, the, um, the 2000 BC, those were the ones that were like closer island hopping, right? Because if it's really, if the islands are close together, that doesn't take a lot of navigational skill. You just, if you can see the other island or you know it's really, really close, you can get there without any kind of navigational skill. It's the, when they start spreading out and expanding further and we'll see trading with South America. And that's where contention really came into play because many said, well, that's not possible, right? Um, they may, they may be able to go from island to island, but they're not going all the way to South America to trade goods and stuff like that. And later it's, it's proven that they can. Um, this included... Oh, here, we'll, we'll put it here. You had bowls with, with the pottery, um, dishes, complex, uh, geometric design, right? And so when you see, um, consistent style of pottery and design in different locations, then you can conclude that, uh, it's most likely made by the same people or at least taught to other people with that same kind of culture. They also had um, patterns that were used by stamps, right? So we'll, we'll just put by stamps here. So even the way that they did the design was unique. So let's look at the first um, kind of question, right? We'll just call it, um, I mean, the answer is it was intentional, but we'll look at intentional migration. So with intentional migration, um, you had, 
essentially the uh, this kind of triangle area that encompassed um, the various islands, uh, Hawaii, Easter Island, and over a thousand islands in the Pacific. Um, that was that was called. It's often called now. It wasn't back then. The Polynesian Triangle. All right. So we'll say uh, encompassed over a thousand islands. And this was the main area of, of early migration. Um, but it, it's not small, right? It, it, with between the, this triangle of, of islands, you have over 621 miles of, of space. Um, and so that takes tremendous skill and courage to be able to um, navigate that when it could take five to six weeks uh, to a destination, right? And you're talking again in open water where it's, you know, it's, it always seems scary to me. Uh, I mean, if you're on a big cruise ship, you know, that sounds like it's like a city, it feels less intimidating. But if you're in a smaller ship in the ocean where you can only see water, that can get intimidating, and especially if you're going, imagine going someplace that no one has ever gone before. It's one thing if you're repeating and going somewhere where people know the destination, they know how to get there. But if you're setting out sail to in search of something, but you don't know what, just that you're going in a general direction that you know where it seems there's an indication of land, that's a lot more intimidating in that process. Um, again, m many of the like later European um, explorers, uh, you know, kind of put this down and said this is impossible. If it happened, it was because they drifted to those islands or, you know, accidentally discovered them. Um, but in instead, it was deliberate migration um, uh, that, that we know based on, again, what we'll see navigation techniques and everything else. We know that um, one of the evidence for this um, shows that the contact with South America is that um, trade. Um, and, and trade also shows that kind of intentional migration um, in, in part because they kept going back and forth to these locations. Um, one of the ones for South America was the sweet potato. Um, and this uh, shows up around 1000 CE. Right, and, and you see this become part of their diet uh, and also um, um, goods that are not from uh, native to the islands in that triangle at all. Um, and where the sweet potato came from was South America, right? So this then shows contact and trade with South America. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the replica canoes showed that as well. So how do you know, like I said, with intentional migration, um, well, it really goes into the next part, the uh, navigational techniques. All right, let's oops, scroll down here. Um, or skills, I wrote skills, but navigational techniques. Uh, and, and this kind of answers quest the last question uh, with the two, like why, why weren't these known? And the reality is, is that many of the navigational techniques were, had been lost for several reasons. Um, so lost over time, we'll say for several reasons. The, um, the first was just that um, European explorers uh, were skeptical. of the um, Polynesian abilities. And the reality is, is that the European explorers were the ones that uh, they came to dominate. And since they, their techniques, their style of navigation became the main mode of navigational skills, um, they dismissed other ways. It also definitely had to do with this idea of, of Western civilization technological superiority. The idea that, right, Europeans were better um, than anyone else and their knowledge 
was superior in every way so there was they just simply dismissed any other way that didn't use their techniques and we see this over and over again in, in with the, the spanish conquistadors which we'll look at with um conquest into um, the americas um, with other um even the chinese almost all societies at some point see themselves as superior you just have european uh views of that often become the dominant theme uh, the other reason was oral tradition the reality was that um, navigational skills were not recorded or written down. Instead, um, they were passed down, um, passed to family, and occasionally uh, uh, friends that were going to become navigators. It was kept um, as a close secret right, to those that were training for that. Um, and so that all played a role in it getting lost, right? Now, there is um, a folklore and cultural hero heroes, oral stories, preserve some of this knowledge. Because of course the question is, if it's lost, how did, how did they rediscover it? How were they able to recreate these canoes? Which we had more evidence of, but how were they then able to use those navigation techniques? Well, like I said, you had uh, it was in their stories, and, and, and probably not everything. We probably don't know all of the ways that they used, only what was preserved in, um, like I said, the, the folklore, cultural heroes, and oral stories that continued to be passed down into modern time. And this ended up preserving some of the navigational history. Um, one of the, uh, probably I guess most well-known, is the legend of Coupe and uh, his discoveries with his navigator, right? So he was the explorer, but then he, he had a, a, a navigator that I w did all the hard work. <laughs> um, he's a legendary figure, and he um, set off um, from Hawaii. So we'll say here, explorer and the story, and set off from Waikiki, which was the um, which is the Polynesian like le the the legendary Polynesian homeland, right? That's where that's the in all the stories that's where they originated from. It's the ancestral homeland, um, and uh, if, if they're based on where they think it might have been, is in the East Polynesian Islands. And then he had his navigator. Uh, Red T was the navigator. And they set off to uh, uh, discover, uh, well, in a lot of the stories, it was about grand adventure and, and um, uh, you know, fighting the, the evil sea monsters and whatever else. There's, there's like several stories where it talks about giant octopuses attacking and things like that. Um, but the navigator, right, he used, let's actually put it here. He, in the story, it talks about how he used the star paths to navigate um, the canoe until they reach landfall. It also talks about wind patterns and um, wave patterns. Right, and so the, the, in, in these very, and there's several versions of this story, but the idea is, right, that it's to, it gives it, okay, so we know that they use the stars, we know that they use the wind, we know that they used, um, that, which is probably, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do, is, is paying attention to the waves, the swells, and knowing with currents, because really this is based on currents. And uh, at some point someone realized that when there was land, it influenced the currents and that could help that. There was also this talk about um, wind patterns and clouds and that certain type of clouds form over, we, we could put just weather, that um, certain types of clouds formed over land masses that don't form over open ocean. So that can help direct you to a, a certain direction if you see those type of weather patterns. Um, all of that, um, helped then um, within those stories uh, you, you had reconstruction of people beginning to go back and look at these oral traditions and tales and and write down how they did these different navigational stuff um, let's look at a quick video and then we'll look at the pictures um, for this 
Um, and this, this is talking about a group that um, uh, uh, rebuilt uh, one of the, the larger voyaging uh, double canoes to uh, all with like traditional style. Um, it, they weren't the first. Again, it was much. It was in the, the late seventies where they they did it for the very first time. But this is one that actually still sometimes sails around today around the world. Um, so let's go off of that. Let's look at the pictures now. Uh, I I think it's just cool to see it in action. Um, and and I always I I want to know where do they go to the bathroom? Probably just into the ocean. Where are they sleeping? Um, <laughs> it, on this more, I mean, it's not a modern one. They they recreated it, so I'm assuming they didn't include a toilet. They're probably going into the ocean. Um, but I I wondered if they'd modified any of that for that, or if they're just sleeping on the the deck and um and, and going to the bathroom outside the ocean. So that <laughs> that's what I think about when I watch that. Uh, but also how impressive it is for for navigating that way. So if we look at um. Some of the early ships, right? This is from the the PowerPoint I had up. Here's the Polynesian Triangle that I was talking about, um, and that that encompasses it in in this triangle here, right? The um, uh, lots and lots of of islands, but then also showcases. Uh, so I mean, these were the main, you know, the the outer edges, Hawaii uh, and and New Zealand, of of where you got Fiji right on the edge to there. Of, of where the main settlements took place. But, and here you can see, right, that we know within chicken, sweet potato, and gourd that these things um, were not native to this region. And were also not native to, you know, maybe some of the islands that were closer, but instead um, came from most likely South America. Um, which would indicate, of course, that they uh, made it that far and were actively trading. And not just once, but uh, uh, several times that had trade routes for these goods. Uh, and, and again, they later proved it with these sailing, like what the people did in the video, the first one in the 70s. Um, and, then, and then in this video with that group, even they were going even further. Um, just showcasing that it was possible to do. And, and once you know how to do it, it's not... Uh, I mean, it's still a hard thing to do, but but it's right. It's, it's not as daunting. Like they they do this trip, they know how to do it. So once the first people um, it, from um, the region managed this trip, it would have been easy to continue doing. Um, so that's that's what a Polynesian Triangle. That's what it looks like here, and specifically connecting to if you know the islands that are in there and the goods that are coming out that it has to come from that region. Here's the ships. I mean, you saw it on the video too. So you have single or double hold canoes. So this one you can see is double, right? And the double ones, um, the canoes were lashed, and they mentioned that too, right? Nothing is obviously they weren't they weren't using nails way way back in the day, um, but that they would lashed everything together with rope. Um, everything's lashed together. That's how you you do it, which is also super impressive. You better have good lashing skills or things fall apart. Um, it, it, the double canoe is the one that's going to um, be the bigger ship for the longer um, exploration. The single canoe is going to be more island hopping base. Um, and then you have the, the sails, which are in this distinctive kind of uh, upside down triangle shape is what it looks like always to me. Um, and, and then long, and you saw that in the video, long steering um, paddle. Right, that goes quite out a bit and it's very long so it allows you to have a lot of control um, but it's not fast movements right it's definitely a slow kind of, of, of movement of steering uh, usually 50 to 60 feet in, in length um, and then the single hold ones I think that was the uh, I only showed the the double ones here the single hold um, ships had a smaller float on the side to help balance it, right? So it'd have, if you had this single canoe, let's say you didn't have this canoe here. I don't know why I didn't put a picture of that one, I should have. If you had this single canoe, right, then you, you would have, like I said, on the side, um, this kind of contraption that would help balance and also allow for stability when turning and making changes in direction. Uh, here's kind of, I like this one just because it breaks down the different parts of it, um, right, with the deck. Um, with the netting, how, where everything is tied down in the sails and how, how they could be used. 
And then here again, just another one. Um, and you do see differences in sail design, which there were. So um, the, I think the most classic is this one with that kind of upside down triangle. And it's one of the older ones. You do see this style as well, where it's just slightly changed the orientation, right? Um, and, and this is a little bit different style of sail that comes in later. Here you can see though, that they do have like a covering to at least be protected from the elements. Um, so what they were using in the replica uh, was these older style uh, where you don't have any kind of covering, you don't have protection. Of course you can make makeshift stuff, but you have more intentional structure with um, the later designs when they're traveling more. Okay, the next one we're gonna look at is the are the Vikings. So let's go back to um, one note here and it always takes a second to register back to that. Come on. All right, I'm gonna pause it and <laughs> wait till it catches up. All right, and probably time to clear out my hard drive if it's stalling so bad. <laughs> um, the next group were the Vikings. And the Vikings are, are super fascinating people. We're not going to get um, into a massive amount of their um, culture and history, but like Viking, like Norse mythology is really interesting. I mean, that's where you have Thor and Loki and Odin. Um, but they're also this complex people because what they're probably no, most known for if in just um, in general uh, society is, of course, raiding because they did do that. Um, that, that, that was, um, you know, kind of how they really expanded into a larger um, um, kingdom was through raids. And um, that became a big part of their culture. But it wasn't the only part of their culture. And I think sometimes Viking... Um, history and structure focuses all on 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 the raiding aspect of their their society and and not always on like the day-to-day -day culture of the average Viking which was not raiding and and fighting um, but it definitely was a, a, a it was a part of their culture so you don't like I said you don't want to pretend that that wasn't there either it's just that it's often um, so focused on that that they forget about like, like I said the the religious structure the average Vikings day-to-day uh, -day life the fact that they did trading too they didn't always raid but because like the Vikings were so feared by other peoples um, that it became what was written down and recorded about Viking history a lot of the time was from these these you're Euro often European although they went to Russia um, they went to the Ottoman Empire so they they went to a variety of places they didn't just go to Europe but they did a lot of raiding and, and also worked as mercenaries in Europe and so the Europeans wrote these stories of the horrors of the Vikings coming and attacking raiding and destroying their monasteries which of course to the Vikings had no religious significance um, and also the raping and looting and pillaging and they were good warriors and they were feared and they also <laughs> they often also attacked at the beginning uh, coastal towns that were not uh, soldiers. So it also made it more uh, fearful because they didn't just attack military uh, targets, right? They, they attacked uh, civilians. Um, and, and so they, we definitely have a lot recorded about that kind of fear of the fearsome Vikings from these raids. One of the things then from how these raids became possible was their shipbuilding and the development of their ships for um, ocean uh, uh, fearing, uh, uh, seafaring voyages. Uh, they also, let me go, let me go, uh, this is going to freeze it again, I'm sure, but let's just look at this for a second. They tended to stick more to coastal regions, right? So you have the Polynesians that did both. They stuck to, um, island hopping and coastal areas, and then they also went out into the open ocean. Um, whereas the Viking routes, if you look at this, uh, uh hang around a lot more. Here is one right where they are are out in the open ocean for a little bit and then you also see them they they go from there to greenland but then they hug the coast and their ships are going to reflect this ability to if you look here like right ability to go into smaller narrow areas to go down rivers to 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 have quick beach landings that was intentional because of what they were wanting to do Right, um, you have the, the Polynesians that were more set up to, um, I knew that was going to freeze again, that were more set up to um, explore and settle, 
the Vikings initially weren't going out to explore and um, to settle, uh, but to raid for goods uh, and set up some trading post. Uh, later, they're going to do more. But but that, that initial aspect of it, so the ships kind of reflect that intent. And we see that in all of the ships. We'll see it with the Chinese and with the por uh, Portuguese. That, that way that the ships were, um, there we go, the way that the ships were created um, was uh, set up on purpose for what they wanted to do with them. Um, and, and so the, like I said, the basis of the expeditions for the Vikings obviously was their, their ship technology. Um, ship structure, we'll say, and technology. So with this, as I was mentioning, right, uh, it was very distinguished because it had a narrow um, keel and a shallow uh, drought. And this, this was intentional because um, what they wanted to do with this was um, it meant by creating it this way that even the largest, um, we'll say warships that they had, um, could, uh, sail onto beaches for quick raids and up rivers, right? The, the, they wanted a very quick beach landing so they could jump out and raid. So that was very much, a. Uh, part of that tactic um, and, and it's really these tactics that allowed for um, uh, sieges like of Paris to be carried out probably one of their most the, the siege that changed um, kind of everything um, let's put first here so early we'll look at the ships in just a second here I'm gonna put here made for raiding all right, that was how they built theirs uh, um, very intentionally in that way. Um, the early expeditions were not super uh, ambitious product uh, projects, right? They they didn't initially go out and and try to sail off into open ocean in very long distance raids. There you go. Right, so the, the earliest ones, what they did, they were meant to be quick uh, surprise uh, raids. That that was the or that was the kind of standard Viking raid for a while, um, and it was o only a few ships, and you know specifically, their goal was goods, was loot. Right, raid what you could. <clears throat> Sorry, get in, get out. Um, that that was the goal. But then you had um, the siege of Paris in um, 885, and this kind of changed the trajectory of what they realized they could do. Um, the 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 this was the present day, so. It was the French capital, but the location, it was, um, it was very small at the time. Um, so it was um, a fortified town, basically, at the time. That um, was on an island. Um, and, and so it, like, it was set up definitely as like that, that style of, of castle and, and siege medieval warfare style in the middle of the sea. Uh, and like I said, this changed, um, the character of Viking raids because what happens is one they realize that that there are larger prizes that they can do um and they begin to send full invasion forces and um that there's a benefit to um taking uh on larger governments uh, or kingdoms uh essentially they also started to go further uh 
go further than before, right? They were willing to go on the open ocean longer. They were willing to go further or because one of the things, right, is that this is more riches. Oops, why did it change? Change the nature here. We'll put it here. More riches and um, power, political power specifically, um, because this allowed them to become more involved in uh, foreign political um, matters in general. So this is where I mentioned that they um, uh, often functioned as mercenaries. For example, um, they were mercenaries for the Frankish Empire, um, Empire and England. And this was seen as something that they also developed into because this paid really well. And it gave them land. So this leads to the idea of settlement, where some Vikings began to settle outside of their main homeland into new areas um, and farming, which again, a lot of Vikings were farmers, not soldiers. But, but that, is, that is the main thing that, um, you know, that people think of with the Vikings is that. Uh, and so this, they didn't, you know, and again, they didn't always start out uh, in, we'll put, let's see, D here, um, trade was also something they did, as I mentioned, it wasn't always fighting. Um, the trade was part of this. Um, they had, they started creating large cargo ships, which you could argue, okay, the cargo ships were for um, storing more goods. Um, but the way that they were created was they were not warships, not in the same design as the earlier warships. We also know um, that we, they ended up with, with trade routes specifically because there was a lucrative market in, um, Arabic silver coins, which they found at the Vikings, uh, in, in their home land, which they obviously brought over, um, slaves, silks, and spices. And these things were valuable, and if you could trade it rather than fighting, you know, that's less resources used in, in that sense. We also know that this, that this took place because you have um, trade routes. Um, let's see, I already have wrote trade routes, but specifically trade routes to Eastern Europe um, and Russia, where they set up um, let me put it under here real quick. They set up uh, small trading outposts so that they were creating kind of like a permanent trading outpost in town for continued journeys. Um, they also were looking to um, head to um, really the um, Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire. So that there was a goal to Byzantine Empire, but they also and they traded with the Ottomans as well, um, because I mean the Byzantine Empire was the trading central of the Mediterranean, um, and so they could buy products there that they couldn't get anywhere else, and they certainly weren't attacking and invading um, uh, the Byzantine Empire at its height, um, but that along the way we know that they. Um, they uh, went to various places in the Ottoman Empire as well, right? So the, the, this is the idea that, again, it was just raiding is, is not accurate because they did combine the seafaring with trade. So let's look at their ships here, right? You can see they're, 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 they, you have the smaller ones here. What they would actually do is they would all store their shields while they sailed along the side on both sides and it was it created a, a defense so if you were being attacked you had this kind of defense with the shields on either side which was um, a smart way of, of doing it again the narrow uh, and shallow um, draft allowed for those those quick 
uh, uh, go basically you sail right onto the beach. If you had it, if it was too, if it wasn't shallow, the problem was is that that would get stuck in the sand. But because it was shallow, or it, it was easy to push on and off of the sand. Um, top speeds were around 17 knots, and he had a double-sided sail, so you could use it from either side. Um, these don't show it as much, but they also had, um, later they get more elaborate, like, decorative uh, front pieces that came as well as intricate carvings into the ship itself. So you can see there's some storage area for food and supplies. There is not a lot of space, right? One of the things you notice between the Polynesians versus this, so the Polynesians didn't seem to have a ton of space either. This has even less. Um, and you would have multiple ships, and obviously like the bigger ships as they went further and further that they made became larger with more space for people. But I mean, this was because they weren't out on the open ocean for five to six weeks. Right, that's why they hugged the coast. That's why they made shorter hops. The Vikings went to a lot of places, but they tended to stick close, closer to coastal regions because of um, the style of their ship and what the purpose was. Um, again, as more and more trade routes developed, they did create larger ships um, that were meant for storing cargo and being a little more comfortable for longer voyages. But the earliest ships and Viking ships were very much raiding military based ships and you could you'd have a whole fleet of these and, and a little bit larger um, that were used for that raiding. But again you could create larger ships than this with that same design so that even a really really large ship still had that flexibility to make it through rivers and um, beach landings. Okay the next group that we're going to look at is China and um, China goes a little bit different um, in, in their style um, because um, they create massive, massive ships. Um, the China, the period where you have the massive exploration is with the Ming Dynasty. And, and, and it's in part because of what's going on during this period. The thing is, is that they're coming off of um, uh, Mongol control. And so, well, let's put that here. So previous dynasty, um, it was the Yuan dynasty, and these were the Mongols. So you already had um, China feeling like they'd been displaced, and 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 this the that dynasty with the Mongols was under like the famous leaders of, of Genghis Khan and Kublai Kai Khan. Okay, so that, that, that group that were running that area and had the dynasty previous, uh, prior to the Ming Dynasty. So the Ming Dynasty overthrew the Mongols and they took over. Um, and, and so one of the things that happened is that they wanted to demonstrate um, their power and might. And so um, the uh, third emperor one by the time that um, you know things were fully under Ming control, Zhu Di was um, anxious and uh, um, interested in showing their power and might by going out to other areas. They they he'd created they'd already created tributary states, right? Where you had states uh, swear allegiance to him and pay him tribute, but he wanted to. Um, basically send a message to other, you know, foreign um, kingdoms and, and the world about their strength. There was also some uh, uh, interest in just, you know, not only showing off your strength um, so that people didn't mess with China, but, but also what could you trade with them as, as well. You know, that certainly played a role in too. He was often described as um, more uh, aggressive um, and then, then later emperors um, and was very much pro, um, oops, that's not what I want to do here, pro expansion exploration. And there will be conflict we'll see with that. Um, later, but this was a way to show um, China's strength and power. Uh, he felt that um, they could make it use of, and China does have at this point um, advanced technology compared to others, and and so he felt that they could could show off 
that power and strength of kind of what he saw as the glory of the Han dynasty and bringing back that glory in that process. Um, and so we should put here too, right? Um, uh, superior technological advancements, and which becomes clear when we look at the che the treasure fleet or the treasure ships uh, in, in a minute here, which I will, I'll show you in just a second. So the main um, uh, person in charge of the um, ocean expeditions um, was actually uh, a eunuch named uh, Sheng He. And he, um, his, it's a little background for him, right? His father and grandfather um, were Muslim. And they were, um, oops, put, they were wealthy, um, high officials to the Mongols that were in charge in the previous dynasty. Um, of course, that changes, right? That he was born right around the time that um, that the Ming Dynasty was fighting, or they weren't the Ming Dynasty yet, but the the, the, the Chinese were fighting to overthrow the Mongols. So when he was 11 years old, he was taken uh, prisoner. Um, and um, he, with a lot of other uh, Mongols and um, Muslim supporters, right? And it was here that he was made a eunuch. And this is, um, a common practice not only in China but but other areas as well um, and then eunuchs were servants uh, to um, the emperor slash administration they usually weren't directly to the emperor and well they die later but if you just were randomly taken prisoner you didn't just immediately go and be a uh, servant to the emperor um, but what happens is actually the eunuchs end up becoming a massive part of Chinese administrative history. Uh, in, in some parts because they thought that eunuchs didn't have the, because they couldn't have a family, um, that then they didn't have the same ambitions that nobility did. And, and many emperors actually during this time frame began to distrust, well, for what they end up distrusting the eunuchs too. But at, at the beginning there was a distrust towards nobility. And the belief that the nobility were helping in the administration and making decisions only that benefited them. And instead, that eunuchs as servants didn't have the same uh, individual interests because they couldn't have a family um, and, and they were servants, that the, the, their priority would be to the emperor and to the, the dynasty. And, and, you know, perhaps some, but it also created a, a whole bureaucratic system of eunuchs who became extremely wealthy and powerful within the Chinese dynasty. And this eventually leads to others mistrusting them um, because there was, um, there were various times where you, we had, we see in history where the eunuchs actually um, perhaps were playing the emperor quite a bit and were essentially running the country um, at times. Um, and so there is going to be pushback towards that as well. But but it became so popular with um, the eunuchs that um, you actually had Chinese men that um, uh, intentionally, not wealthy ones, but poor ones that would intentionally become eunuchs, they would volunteer it, right? If you were captured and made a servant, they would decide whether they wanted you to be a eunuch or not, and you didn't have a choice. Um, and it was painful, right, because the, there were two main methods of making someone a eunuch, uh, taking two rocks and crushing uh, their private part there and um, or cutting it off either way there was a chance of death and uh, you kind of had to heal up from that and it this the um, the kind of mark of whether you were you were gonna live was whether you, you peed uh, freely and uh, clear um, after you'd healed because obviously if it messed up with your ability to go to the bathroom they didn't have uh, um, you know the bags for for that that you you would die um, if they injured it to a certain degree that caused sepsis or other, uh, um, you know, um, infection, you could die. So it was, it was painful and dangerous and he didn't have a, he didn't have a choice. He was a prisoner. He was made a eunuch, but then it be, there became a whole kind of society of eunuchs 
who, um, especially a uh, poor um, Chinese men who knew that this might be the only way for them to have any kind of wealth and power, would volunteer to become eunuchs themselves. Um, and so that they, they would choose to do that because it got them elevated into positions that they otherwise would never have the ability to do. So like the, the, the eunuch history of the eunuchs is really, really interesting. It also coincides with concubines. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that later, but there's a whole connection of concubines, um, which these various kings had multiple wives and hundreds of concubines. And they used eunuchs to guard the concubines because they couldn't have sex with them in the, in the way that they, like, they expected at least, right? That they, well, they aren't going to be able to have sex with them. And many thought, well, they wouldn't even have any desire for women, which wasn't true. But um, they were seen as the ones that could be trusted to guard the women that there were concubines for the king. And the, there's a whole history on concubines and harems and backstabbing and stuff that's really, really crazy. And we'll talk about more when we talk about um, um, the next Chinese dynasty in a, in a later lecture. Um, but, but just to know, like I said, it's a super fascinating thing, or really what it sucks uh, to be that person. But, but the fact that people then were willing to do it uh, willingly because of what it potentially gave them shows how much power that, that eunuchs could end up um, obtaining. Um, right. So, uh, I mean, a small number ultimately became powerful. It's not like all eunuchs became super powerful. It was a small group, but that was, uh, he was one of them that, that, that rose up through ranks in part. He got lucky because he was, um, assigned, um, to the fourth son of the emperor. Well, so, so that helped him, um, definitely become visible, <laughs> uh, uh, to, to the emperor later, right? If he hadn't been assigned, if he had been assigned to some random uh, wealthy person, he might not have ever been noticed. Um, but he ends up becoming a super effective military leader um, for the son and gets recognition and notice for how smart he was and how good of a soldier he was. And then eventually became the commander of uh, China's ocean fleet, right? As, um, and, and really, uh, a valued member of the emperor's party. Um, from, let's see, there were a total of seven voyages that he made uh, between 1405 and 1433. Okay, and um, the, the, the these voyages were, um, he commanded what were called the treasure fleet. And that has two parts to it. The first, of course, is the, the treasure ships. And the treasure ships were massive, massive ships um, that were over 400 feet in um, length and um, 160 feet wide. It had, and we'll look at the pictures in here in just a second with this, nine masts, uh, 12 sails, and four decks. Um, it could carry, let's, let's say carried here. There we go. Carried uh, 2,500 tons of cargo including a giraffe. They brought back a giraffe on one of their voyages. Um, so he brought back massively large animals, tons of goods to bring back to show off to the emperor. Um, and and it, this would be super, and these ships were massively intimidating. It was armed with dozens of cannons. And um, then the second part of the treasure fleet were smaller ships. Oh, I forgot one of the part I want to put on there here. We'll put the smaller ships in just a second. The treasure ship also um, had a, a functioning farm where they um, grew crops and had some animals to feed uh, the, the fleet. Right, and the fact that just the storage and stuff that they brought, um, that they could um, uh, store a giraffe and other large animals, then, which the, the, out of all the stuff he brought back, the giraffe was what they, were, they most were impressed with and interested with. But then you also had smaller ships, 
that went with the fleet? Which one were more uh, mobile? Because obviously the larger ship you couldn't really uh, move around really fast. Um, and it, it was hundreds of ships. And these had supplies. For example, um, you, you had, I mean, food was stored on both. And, and obviously they were trying to grow and maintain some of their own food on the larger treasure ship. But they also had one, uh, several ships, not just one, that were only full of water, drinkable water. Um, so that, that the treasure ship didn't have to be burdened down by storing that. And then, of course, just um, manpower and weapons and so on, right? So this massive fleet is coming at you uh, of, of with, with, the, with the biggest ship of, of the time. So let's, let's look at this. Here are the routes of the trading routes that you can see, um, not only around the coastal areas of China, but India, um, the Middle East, and Africa. Um, and and the again, the goal was one to show off their power and control, um, and how strong. I mean, and certainly technically advanced China was, but also to to look at trading routes. There was some suggestion. There was also to see what else the world had to offer. Um, and some suggestions of why it ends is ultimately like that the, they brought stuff back and the Chinese were like, meh, we're, we got all that crap already, except for the giraffe. <laughs> they were very interested in the giraffe. But kind of this idea of like the world doesn't have any more technological advances than, than what we are because they, the really China was always in the world uh, um, ahead of everyone technologically. Um, and and they, that, they, they proved that with these ships. So this gives you the size of this, right? Um, the, the ship, the treasure ship, here's like the multiple stories. They had a, a, a farm, uh, on the other side of the deck and you can see, like I said, the, the sails, the massive sails. This is the type of ship that is the Portuguese Caravelle and what Christopher Columbus uses. So just to give you a, an idea of size, cause it's hard to envision it, right? These, this was like a cruise ship. The cruise ships are massive. And the, the size comparison of what uh, uh, that was seen, and they, they, yeah, the Caraval ships were smaller. They weren't the biggest ships out there, but they still weren't tiny compared to like what we've seen with like the Polynesians and the Vikings. And, but most people, this was kind of the size of ship they used. And then, and then you see this behemoth of a ship. So imagine being a, a kingdom uh, and, and seeing not only this ship coming towards you, but hundreds of other smaller ships in the Armada, essentially. It would be intimidating, and it was built for intimidation. Not surprisingly, though, it's super, super expensive to purchase, uh, to pur they didn't purchase it, to build it. It's super expensive to, to, to build it. This took a ton of resources, which is also gonna be one of the critiques for why, you know, the argument is China had the capability to explore the world before the Europeans. Technically, you know, the Polynesians did seem to have as well, um, although they didn't go quite that far. But the, the, the ship capability here, they had the ability to do that. So why didn't they? Well, we'll talk about why it ends in a minute, because, right, it, they weren't the ones that ended up going to the Americas um, and, and, and settling and expanding, um, even though there was some push for that. And that was somewhat of the goal. Well, the goal was an expansion, right? That's part of the issue. The, the, China wasn't looking to expand so much as expand their power and their reputation. Um, so people wouldn't mess with them. Um, and because they didn't, they kind of looked around the world and said, we don't, we have what we need. Nothing is impressing us here um, in, in that. Here's another model of it to give you an idea, right? So you had um, the, the different uh, areas for sleeping quarters. And then they, the supposedly around here, they had a farm. Um, that that with the light right and they they built it up a box with all the dirt and they had um, different um, crops that they were growing but again just the difference in size was a good indicator of that and then here shows some of the insides of the Chinese treasure ship an elephant is dwarfed in a giraffe by um, <laughs> just the cargo hold area they could fit so many large animals and, and goods. And they did. They brought back Buddha statues. They brought back gold. They brought back anything exotic and, and unique that they could find. They brought back to show to the emperor. That was one of their stated goals, to bring back massive goods. 
I mean, they even like the captain quarters is a whole house on the ship. The, like this ship to me and the cargo storage space and just um, the size of the ship and, and, and the technology that it required to build this is amazing um and 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 far beyond what comes after uh, for you know quite a long time i think that's the last one yeah we'll go to the portuguese well let's look at it here so um, well i got let me finish with the um the why did this end right because the the reality is is that um or five here the reality is that they had the technology they had the ability they had the larger ships so um you know, why weren't they the ones to continue on and end up discovering the Americas or something like that? Well, ultimately is that the Ming Dynasty um, was divided into two really um, main factions. One was the pro-expansion, um, the pro-expansionist exploration. And then you had the other group which was a more conservative, Confucius, uh, Confucian court. And they were on opposite sides of the spectrum of what they thought they should do. Um, and so you, you had a, a court that was divided. Those that said, yes, we should be exploring, we should be expanding. Um, and, and if nothing else, like seeing what the rest of the world has to offer and showing off our might and power and maybe settling. And then you had the other group, Confucius thought that, that saw this as wasteful, and unnecessary and um, Confucius uh, philosophy often looked inward um, and especially conservative Confucius philosophy which was a part of China we looked at that you know in the past uh, of that it was it was into they you looked internally and and you didn't do these kind of extreme measures instead you focused on the court and what was going on in China itself and so there was disagreement for that another was it was extremely expensive obviously right for for the building for the voyages from the manpower and what you had to provide for it um and another thing that that caused some issue were the eunuchs um and the uh, con uh ever rising concern um for the power that eunuchs had and um within the political structure and, and so the, the admiral of the fleet was a eunuch. And then that was used as an example along with what was going on um, that way. Um, and, and so this idea of, of politics, wasteful, expensive voyages um, uh, led to conflicts and confrontation. And then of course, what I mentioned before, the uh, Chinese worldview of specifically, right, that they were the center of the universe essentially they were the most important many societies see this but that others had nothing uh significant to offer i mean it's it's why um later china actually shuts down their borders and stops trading with people for a while because they get very isolationist and that definitely was influenced by confucian thought um, but also they get isolationists because like we're more technologically advanced than anyone that wants to trade with us. All of these people are, are just going to want our stuff, right? And they don't have anything to offer us. Sure, they like the giraffe. They were super interested in some of these unique things. But as a whole, what did it, the world have to offer China? China said, meh, nothing, really. Um, and Confucian thought reinforced that idea of isolation. So like I said, and later, they actually shut down the borders as the world continues to trade, China becomes more and more isolationist. Um, it doesn't ultimately go well for them because the various European traders force their way in as Europeans are wont to do. Um, but nonetheless, that, that does kind of be what it is. So when the, the emperor dies, um, the essentially it's uh, the, the ship's are uh, left to rot um, and uh, exploration uh, stops under um, the next emperor. 
right? Because it, it just the, the the it becomes less seen as less and less valuable in that that regard. Okay, the last group then is um, I think that's that's four here is the um, Portugal and the Portuguese, right? Which gets us right up to Columbus. Um, so you know the thing with that is that um, um, Portugal um, becomes and are, you know, really was one of the major um, players in European exploration, both in their ship design and as, as they're really the early Europeans to begin um, exploring and, and doing trading. They're also going to be the earliest start to the slave trade, which we'll look at in a, in a future lecture. Right, it's the Portuguese that start that, and then others um, um, uh, kind of follow that path when they realize that there's wealth to be made in that. Um, so you have as as early as 1317, um, the king made an agreement um, with the merchants um, to create essentially. Um, an official um, navy. Um, so the part of their goal was to create um, a Portuguese navy because you did by this time have um, pirates that were raiding and attacking. Um, and, and so the Portuguese navy could provide protection from pirate raids and also because they were merchants focus on trade and wealth in the process sorry if we've looked at each one of these the polynesians their goal was um really what appears to be some exploration but settlement the vikings their goal was raiding wealth and some trade the chinese were looking for more showing off their power um, and and uh, perhaps you know finding some unique things. The Portuguese were for initial pro initially protection and then largely economic. So they all had different goals for why they had this oceanic exploration, and it does shape with the Portuguese with this emphasis on trade and wealth why they go where they go, and the type of ships that they created in that process. Um, so while well, it was against um, um, some against these pirates um, and raids that were taking place at the time and protection, trade and wealth were definitely more at the forefront of that. This then coincides with the bubonic plague, right? Because what happens is with the bubonic plague, you have a couple of things that, that, that take place. Um, significant if not severe depopulation, um, which leads to several other things. Um, one, depopulation creates extremely um, localized economy in individual towns for a while. It also created a sense of fear of, of um, weakness, right? That, that they were in a weak position. Um, you have unemployment rise as it destabilized the society in general. This also led to migration to urban centers as much as they were urban centers at this point, which this leads to um, uh, abandonment of agricultural land. Right, so what the what all this gets connected to the that is that um, sea voyages, specifically because of trade and wealth and fishing, which became a new thing, offered an alternative and perhaps a way back from the problems that were taking place in that. Let's go. There you go. Um, and sorry, I just had this thought that I, I didn't unhit pause, but I did. <laughs> it would have been horrible if it wasn't recording. 
Um, and, and so it offered an opportunity and a, and a difference between that. Um, and then what happens from there is that you have full public and monetary support um, um, by the king, um, which was from 1325 to 1357, uh, King Afonso IV um, granted public funding Um, and and essentially ordered explorations, right? To find well, to find spices. So uh, some of the early things that they did with this were um, because it was it was about wealth, it was about trade, um, and it froze up again here. Come on. All right, hang on just a second. All right, this time my pen just died. I was having technological issues here. <laughs> um, the, 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 the idea was is that early exploration was about wealth. So the issue was is that their goal was to play it safe. Be, even though they had um, public funding, so while there was public funding, they also had um, investors, and not every merchant and explorer um, had public funding either, right? And investors, they want to return. So you stay to known routes and coastal regions, right? If you hug the coast, it's safer than going out exploring um, open ocean. This leads to their, their early um, routes and trade was Africa, the coast of Africa. Now, um, again, the belief was, right, if you follow coast of Africa, which was a safer way to travel, right, that would get you to India with spices. So... You know, we see we're going to see that with Christopher Columbus too. That it was just an alternate aspect of that. But with the coast of Africa, right? When they when they started in Africa, oops, see here, <clears throat> like they were looking for goods to trade. It didn't start off, and we're going to talk more about this with slavery. But it didn't start off with slaves. Instead, they were looking for gold. Um, they were looking for. Um, spices they were looking for just in general any type of goods that can make them money um, and they did this by quick raids quick coastal raids they would land or they well they would set their boats they would uh, row in right and you would uh, raid coastal towns for goods and then go back to the ship and leave it's like smash and grab, basically. Well, not surprisingly, coastal towns and kingdoms didn't like this. Um, and they ended up making deals um, with the Portuguese. Right? That's okay. Look, you only have limited amount of supplies on the coastal town, and you've kind of raided them out anyway. We can go inland where there's better goods. Um, stop raiding us and attacking us, give us some goods, and then we'll bring you stuff, right? Um, and so that's what they ended up doing. This eventually led to realization that uh, people uh, in form of slaves, and again, um, we're going to talk about this in a separate lecture in more detail, uh, were valuable. And that's going to kickstart off the slave market. And it's why Africa then becomes a central slave market. They didn't go to Africa initially looking for slaves. They went looking for gold and, and spices and other goods. But realized that slaves were a commodity that had value and wealth. And that became the sole and complete focus um, of that. Again, talk about that more 
um, in, in, in a future lecture. Um, and then lastly, just the ships themselves, right? They were designed to be highly maneuverable um, and, and they were quicker, which allowed them for maneuvering into certain areas. So let's look at the last ones here. Uh, here you can see a Portuguese route. I mean, they end up going to a lot of places. You have um, De Gama that goes to India and, and, and on quite uh, a few uh, um, exploration. So that you do after, this is the, see all the uh, hugging the coast of Africa? This was the safe trade routes. And this is what they stuck to the most. Later after and around Columbus, you have more bold, it's still sticking to the coast, but longer voyages, more bold. See, De Gama even went into more open ocean too. Um, but, but ultimately, what the purpose was, was trade routes and money. Um, and so you have raiding, you have trades, you have places that they set up for their own forts um, to continue trade, to continue finding routes of wealth. And merchants, because they were investors, didn't, weren't going to go that way. Um, and, um, or, yeah, they weren't going to be like, okay, let's just take off and see what we find because many thought, well, you're not going to make it anywhere. You're not going to make it all the way over to here. Our ships are smaller. They're not meant to, to do uh, months of open water. You're going to die in the middle of the water. <laughs> and the investors weren't going to pay for that. So they, they tend to stick there. But it does kickstart off further European exploration. So here are the Carvel ships. You can see they were small and highly maneuverable, two to three masts at first. Um, with um, uh, the, the tr kind of uh, this unique shape of sail. Um, some were triangle, more triangle at first too. Later they had four mast and the more square sail. So you had a, a more triangle and then the square sail. 50 to 75 feet. They actually were smaller than that too. It could go around like 39 um, feet to 75 feet. 75 feet was at the very, very height though. Um, you, you were looking more often at 40 to 50 feet was the average, right? But that's the full range. Um, and then, let's see, here's, the, here's another example of it pulling in, right? So you had places to sleep and some storage, um, but, but they were still fast and maneuverable, um, but could handle um, parts of the open ocean. And these became the go-to ships for European exploration. Um, with the Portuguese first really pushing for that and other European um, uh, countries responding to that and wanting to get their own uh, foot into the door um, to, to, you know, negotiate trade routes or, or lock down uh, regions of wealth. Um, we'll talk about more, we mentioned, talk about Columbus um, uh, and, and, and how Spain, uh, you know, basically Columbus is rejected by almost everyone because of um, his theories were and calculations were off. Not, not because people thought the world was flat um, and he thought it was round, not that at all. People knew the world was round. It was because his calculations were way off from all other navigators. And they're like, dude, you're gonna die in the middle of the ocean to, if you're trying to get to Asia. And if the, and if the Americas uh, weren't there as a landmass, he would have. Um, it's just that he happened to run into a landmass that he didn't know about. Um, so we'll talk about that next time. Um, and that, that is it for there. Hopefully you see though, like I said, there were tons of, um, these are just four, there was a few others, but these were four big, uh, 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 societies that were doing significant exploration with significant technology and ship design, obviously for, right, each of their own purposes before, um, you know, Columbus came around before you can continue your ex European exploration. But it also shows that the world was becoming more and more connected as time went on to where um, various kingdoms and dynasties were exploring and connecting and trading with the world. And we knew that was happening because of the spread of the bubonic plague, but it just continued to, to skyrocket in the amount that took place after the bubonic plague. And then, of course, with the news of Christopher Columbus's discovery, that kick-started off kind of a mass hysteria of exploration afterwards you know columbus was a horrible person but one of the consequences of what um his his discovery was that it kick-started off even a more connected world base because of more people wanting to find new things and explore um all right so that will be it for um this lecture